Around 6,000 years ago, prehistoric communities living on the British Isles began to erect and arrange massive stones, forming some of Europe's most enigmatic and iconic landmarks. Time capsules to our ancient past, Britain's prehistoric monuments have captivated the public imagination for centuries. But while at first mysterious, modern research has helped us roughly understand their age, their creators, and perhaps most importantly, their purpose. So Cumbria might not be the first place most people think about when they think about prehistory because we've got big monuments down south like Stonehenge, but we do have some incredible things happening in Cumbria in the prehistoric period, including places like Long Meg, which in its circumference is about as big as Stonehenge. Activity at these sites is believed to have occurred during two distinct periods, the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. Times of rapid innovation in both culture and technology this span of time between 4000 BC and 700 BC could be considered a prehistoric golden age of sorts. While it is easy to lump all prehistoric stone monuments into a single category, there are several key distinctions between monuments created during the Neolithic and those created during the Bronze Age. So the Neolithic is part of what we call the Stone Age. And the Stone Age is a really vast period of time and it spans from when um, humans started settling in um, Britain, so we call that the Paleolithic, through to the Mesolithic, which is also called the Middle Stone Age, and then to the Neolithic, which is the New Stone Age. One leading theory suggests that a population from mainland Europe migrated to England around 4000 BC, bringing with them innovative farming techniques fixed human settlements and a complex religious system. Simply put, the Neolithic was a period of the Stone Age where people were becoming far more settled in their landscape. This is important, as a settled lifestyle afforded Neolithic farmers time to build. The many monuments that characterise British prehistory derive from the Neolithic. Stone circles and burial cairns emerged during this period, and earthworks, such as Henge monuments, were created on a grand scale often accompanying megalithic sites, mega meaning massive and lithic meaning stone. Neolithic builders clearly needed large enclosures, which they often created by arranging unshapen boulders into circles. Nowadays, we might think of this as something of a temple, like a modern day church or mosque. We have about a quarter of all the UK stone circles in Cumbria. So we were clearly a place where building these structures was really important to the people who lived here. Nobody really knows what they were for um, or why they were built or how they were built, but we know that they must have been pretty important because they were pretty difficult to build. There is perhaps no better example of this than Castle Rig. Thought to have been constructed over 5,000 years ago, Castle Rig is known to be a Neolithic creation, due in part to the discovery of several perplexing stone tools found buried within its centre. The Langdale axes, although they may not be the shiniest things on the planet, they are actually some of the most important things we have for the Neolithic in Cumbria. Stone axe heads originating from the Langdale Valley in the Southern Lake District are among the most puzzling artifacts from the Neolithic. These skillfully honed tools make up over a quarter of all prehistoric axe heads discovered in Britain. They originate from what is known as the Langdale Axe Factory. They're often found in ritual structures such as stone circles, henges, um, mostly of Neolithic origin, but they are also found at the edge of waterways. The smaller axes such as this are found in some settlement sites and other sites where day-to-day -day domestic activities were being held. Langdale axes have been discovered as far away as Ireland and the Orkney Isles, and some specimens have even been dredged from the bottom of the River Thames. There is little evidence to suggest that quarrying for these axes was performed at lower altitudes. Instead, the vast majority of these axes were created exclusively using stone from the Lake District's mountains, which begs the question, why? 
Um, here we have uh, a small axe head. It fits quite nicely into the palm of your hand. And this was more likely to be a practical tool compared to this example here, which is probably too big and too heavy to be a practical use. So we think that perhaps this was a ceremonial hand axe or something that denoted social status. To summarize, if these were ceremonial tools, one could suggest that the danger involved in quarrying contributed to their value. So we're really looking at a prolific industry, which makes us question how important was Cumbria in the Neolithic? A clue to understanding Langdale's importance may actually lay in the hands of an unusual Neolithic practice. Prehistoric rock carvings are rare in the Lake District, and for centuries they were believed to be almost non-existent. This belief would not stand the test of time, however, as a massive canvas of rock carvings was discovered close to the Axe Factory back in 1999 at a site known as Copt Howe. Bizarre, esoteric carvings adorn the sides of two massive rock faces, which form a natural enclave known as the Langdale Boulders. The etchings here can be split into three unique categories. First, there are the cups, concave dimples pecked into the rock face. Secondly, there are the ring markings, concentric circular motifs, which are often found alongside cups. Thirdly, and conceivably most importantly, are the most abstract motifs. Of all the carvings of Coptow, these winding lines are the most evident. Unlike the cup and ring marks found on the rock face, these motifs are seemingly out of place. As was suggested after a 2018 excavation of the rocks, these lines appear to have more in common with motifs adorning another distinctly Neolithic monument, Irish passage tombs. Earthen mausoleums with interiors made from megalithic blocks. In Cumbria, no examples of such monuments survive, but we can infer that some Irish influence occurred here during the Neolithic period it would seem that Cumbria was well connected to overseas trade routes during this period, and the sheer abundance of Neolithic enclosures would suggest that the region was thriving. A highly religious peoples, these early farmers would use stone circles as temples. They would leave stone axes as votive offerings, and using cup and ring markings, they would mark spiritually significant areas. Megalithic chambers, while not surviving in Cumbria, were later used as communal mausoleums, possibly a cultural import from Ireland. It makes me feel really privileged to be able to hold this extremely delicate fragment because it's one of a kind for Cumbria. And for me, it really demonstrates that we have gold objects in Cumbria, we had high status in Cumbria, and it really shows there was a thriving Bronze Age community here. The Bronze Age followed directly on from the Neolithic around the year 2500 BC. It marked the end of the Stone Age and the start of a major development of cultural ideas across Britain. Uh, like the Neolithic or the Stone Age, the Bronze Age is quite hard to define because it's not a precise moment in time. It's more a transition uh, where people began to stop using stone as their primary material and start experimenting with metal. So this was a gradual shift in ideas as metallurgy spread all across Europe by both invasions and trade. Although the name implies that this was a time marked by the use of bronze, the Bronze Age is better explained as the period in which people began to produce simple metals, leading to a boom in bronze, copper and gold production. But this transition was not easy. Those early farmers of the Neolithic would see a dramatic decline in population, and DNA science has shown up to 90% of the population may have disappeared. Their replacement? The Belbeak people, who had migrated to Britain from Eastern Europe around 2500 BC, it gets complicated, and we will not go into too much detail about the Beak people in this documentary, as evidence from their culture is sadly not very prevalent in Cumbria. However, excavations at Oddendale Stone Circle and Levens Park Ring Cairn have contained crouched inhumations, a style of burial typical of the Beak culture. Like Neolithic burials that preceded them, crouched inhumations were not cremated. Instead, the deceased were buried in a fetal position, 
in individual graves. So this is when we start getting uh, barrows, which are big earthen mounds. And the other thing is cairns. These are quite popular in Cumbria, probably due to the amount of stone we have in the area. It was an easy building source to get a hold of. An excellent example of Bronze Age monument building in a style most common in Cumbria is what's known as the burial circle. These enclosures come in two distinct varieties. Firstly, there are the single burials, a small stone circle surrounding an individual burial cairn. Secondly, and later, there are the cremation cemeteries, larger enclosures of stone, which oftentimes contained many burial urns. So people in the Bronze Age were frequently cremated and buried in pots like this urn. Uh, this is quite a small example. They can get quite big, about three or four times the size of this. Um, and they weren't buried this way up. They were often buried with uh, the pot facing downwards with the ashes in the bottom. And not everybody was buried with a whole pot. Sometimes you just get a piece of pot buried with the ashes of the dead. And sometimes you get uh, what we call accessory vessels. So they are smaller pots buried with the main cremation and they might contain objects like uh, beads or jewellery um, to go with the burial. Often confused as strictly ritual enclosures, burial circles like these were perhaps no more ritual than a modern graveyard. Uh, you can get many people put into the urns, but we start to move towards more individual burials. Um, again, representing this move from a group activity into more revering the individual. Comparing, for instance, Swinside, a Neolithic circle, to nearby Lacra B, it is easy to see just how small things had gotten in just about a thousand years. With the emergence of material wealth, of material hierarchy, communities became splintered. The old ways of banding together in a more communal effort to build big, well, they were over. And as a replacement came more utilitarian architecture. The stone monuments of Cumbria are only a snippet of what European prehistory has to offer. But hidden within this relatively small region is evidence of trade and industry, of religion and spirituality, even of political change. These stone monuments, which are often dismissed as mysterious, demonstrate a very human story of perseverance beyond technical limitations. Those people who climbed to the peaks of Langdale likely didn't know the lasting impact of their ascent. But whether directed by God or by the ancestors, in starting their climb, in reaching for the clouds in search of something important, they undoubtedly found just that. The modern world. <laughs>